I do some consulting work on American The feeling in the room was you probably... Don't ever say to her that her point about the shower points. She doesn't have any discussion on the ethical we laugh. It's more of a community. We're trying to back up currently doing in autism. Kathy Matea is one of the most successful women in country music. The two-time Grammy award-winning singer and West Virginia native combines elements of folk, Celtic gospel, and bluegrass. Never afraid to push the creative envelope, her newest albums, Coal and Calling Me Home, are her most personal and daring. Both records pay tribute to her rich alto and to the folk music of her native Appalachia. Matea also uses her voice to raise awareness about critical issues. She was an early advocate for AIDS awareness and later Alzheimer's disease. Today she speaks out about climate change. We'll talk with her about the power of music and her fight to end mountaintop removal. Here's our conversation with Kathy Matea. Kathy Matea, welcome to the conversation. Thank you very much, Patty. Thanks for having me. You've been at this now uh, for, for more than three decades, and, and most people know you for songs like 18 Wheels and a Dozen Roses, uh, Love at the Five and Dime, Where Have You Been? Tell us a little bit about when you discovered that music was where your heart was. Well, that was kind of a process. Uh, I was the whiz kid in my family. I, I came out asking questions. I was sort of the kind of kid you'd give riddle into now <laughs> these days, but... Uh, my mom really engaged with me, and uh, when I got into to school, they tested me to double promote me, so I skipped the first grade. And when they were testing me, they, my, they just told my mom not to let me get bored, so she put me in, you know, skating and horseback riding and piano lessons. And the only thing that didn't get boring had to do with music, so that became the thread that ran through everything. And over time, really, I think I was drawn to music because... Looking back, it, it really created community with people. It was a way to glue people together. It was a way to ha begin conversations. It was a way to open things up. And, and I think that's still really true for me. You started uh, West Virginia University in 1976. You were all of 17 years old. Yes. And you were studying engineering. Yes. It would seem to me that it was uh, kind of a, a risk taker to say two years <laughs> later, I'm going to pursue music and forget about this very safe engineering degree. Yeah, that was a phone call I won't forget. Mom, Dad, look, college has just been great. Hey, I think I'm going to move to Nashville with a boy and write songs. <laughs> it was not... Uh, Did they was, try to talk you out of it? Yeah. Thunderous silence on the other end of the phone. And they were, but they, they really, they were so graceful about it all that I went and spent three weeks with them and said, I want to tell you all the reasons I want to go. And I want to hear all the reasons why you think I shouldn't. And we didn't agree, but, but we respected each other's opinion and we cared enough to hear each other out. And that, I think, was a pretty amazing thing. And it changed my relationship. That was the moment I stepped across the line and had an adult relationship with my parents. Now, you weren't there that long. Uh, by 1983, you had signed uh, a contract. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And leading up to that, because I think it's, it's interesting, you'd been singing demos for other people, and, and someone at the other end said, who is this on all of these demos? Yeah. And they called you in. Well, it was sort of that thing. That happened. I'd been singing, and I'd been getting some good feedback on all these. I came up through the studio, the, the ranks of the studio singers. And then uh, I could kind of feel momentum, and I thought, well, if this happens, I better know how to front a band. I'm going to need that skill. So I put a band together and started playing in a little club once a month. And within three months of that, I had a record deal. So I was kind of working it from both ends. And uh, um, it was I, my first single came out five years to the day from the day I rolled into town. You said that you are glad that the music you're singing right now didn't come to you until later in your career, that you wouldn't have been ready for it. Well, I think um, I would love to have come up in this music. There was no one around. I was like a sponge. I would learn music from anybody around me. There was nobody doing anything formal around me. So I just took what I could get. And so uh, there was nobody steeped in this music that I was hanging with it when I was young. So I often think... The music that's on Cole and, and Cole Yes, and yes, that Appalachian, the traditional Appalachian music. And I often think, what would have happened if I'd started singing that young and it really sunk in? But by the same token... Now that I, I'm 50 and I, you know, my voice has matured and I've lived some life, I think there's more credibility in my voice. Like there's a lot more low end and richness and uh, it doesn't sound 20 and innocent. 
And I think that lends some, some gravitas to the songs. I, I've looked at the things that have become really important issues to you over your career. Uh, AIDS and HIV awareness, uh, later Alzheimer's disease, uh, the arts, and, and most recently, the environment. Tell us a little bit about how the environment became your passion, your, your, really, your mission at this point in your life. Um, my mission at this point in my life is to be of service however I can. And so um, what happened was I, I went to see uh, Al Gore give a lecture and I didn't know what it was going to be about and it turned out to be the slideshow around an inconvenient truth. And This is before it, it Before the national, movie came right? out, right. And I, it really, it really, you know, I was... I was moved to my toenails, and I started looking for ways to help out, contribute to the conversation, and then that led me to issues around coal and uh, issues about what was going on in the coal fields back home, and, and at the same time, this music, I got drawn to this music for, for a completely different reason, and then all of a sudden, it all just came together and became one thing. So um, it was very, it feels very organic to me. Like, I don't think I, I never set out to be an activist. You know, it was like not something The that, accidental act yeah, activist. Yeah, I, I call myself the reluctant activist. <laughs> but an inch at a time, trying to be of service and following the open doors, you know, you step into something and suddenly you wake up and it's like, oh, well, this is interesting. You know, it wasn't really, it wasn't a goal. It was really, the goal was a, a more inner kind of, uh, something fueled by a certain kind of compass. And then the way it manifests sort of keeps opening up. You've said that the, the work you've done on these last two albums, Cole and Calling Me Home, has made you look at writing, look at uh, playing, look at recording in a completely different way. How so? Um, it's made me think about singing in a different way because a lot of, I mean, you cover Hazel Dickens' work. Hazel Dickens has no frills. There is no frills. It is like there is no barrier between you know, her gut and the music. She's, there's nothing self-conscious about her. I just wanted to try, in my own way, to connect with the songs as viscerally as Hazel does. And I'll never be able to do that. But that goal stripped away a layer of something that I thought I needed as a singer. And I still learn that every night. Old habits come in, and I just want to, like, shed, shed, shed and just be in the song. I've listened to your rendition of, of songs that she wrote and you're now performing in yours, and it's it's really interesting to do that. And then I uh, listened to the Ellen and Don't Stop Here Anymore, which mm. was written by uh, Jean Ritchie. By Jean Ritchie. Mm -hmm. And she posted something online. She said, I don't know if you saw it. She wrote, great treatment of my song, Kathy, and what a spirited band. I hear you using June Cash's adaptation of ah! my tune in this presentation, but I'm not a stickler, so you're forgiven for that. George and I are looking forward to the finished project soon I hope and I just thought you know only in the internet age could something as intimate and just interesting as that happen I never saw that I had the feeling you might not have seen it she um, she I do have correspondence from her when she emailed me and I have spent time with her talking about the way people change her songs and how hard that is for her um, I mean when I you know there's a it wasn't the first time I met her, but there was a time when we were doing something together, and she was like, I don't even know where you got that melody. That second note you're singing, I don't know where that came from. I said, well, teach me. Teach it to me. And, um, and so the, I, I, I've been a little worried about some of the interpretations, and I just got word from her sons. Last week, two of her sons came to the show and, uh, and said, no, we played her everything you did, and she, she gave it her seal of approval. So, <laughs> so I'm really glad. What was it like the first time uh, you got on stage and sang one of these old-timey songs, a cappella? I mean, you were used to really a, a very different scene earlier in your career. I've done a cappella stuff before, um, some gospel-y kind of stuff and some group stuff. Um, so it wasn't, that wasn't so foreign to me. But, the, I mean, when you stand on stage and sing Black Lung, that is really different than anything else. And it took me six months to even decide if I could do that song, like before I ever recorded it. And there's this moment when I was singing it and, uh, and uh, it was at a gathering, a national music kind of convention thing. And someone told me before I walked on stage that Hazel was in the fourth row. 
So there I am singing her signature song about her brother who has died of black lung and it's a gut wrencher. And I thought, okay, well, Kathy, either you own this song, your version of this song as your point of view about it or not. And this is your acid test. And so it was like definitely a, you know, grow yourself up moment. And she was very gracious about it. But um, she said, oh, it was kind of nice to sit in the audience and just listen to it and not have to be singing it. She said, it really made me see the song in a different way. Down in the poor house on starvation's plan Where pride is a stranger and doomed is a man His soul full of coal dust till his body's decayed And everyone but black lungs done turn him away it's a powerful song. It's just a heart-wrenching song, really, about someone dying of black lung. But there have been other really difficult songs to sing, and I, I think of the song that was written by your husband mm. and that you resisted singing for quite a while, Where Have You Been? Yeah. Which is about his grandparents. His grandparents. But it touches you because of the loss of your own mother to Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, when I recorded it, that's part of what's so interesting about getting to do this for a long time. You record a song at a certain season of your life and then you have completely different points of view about the same song as your life shifts and changes, as your voice changes, as your experience with the song deepens. And so that's part of what is so uh, fun about doing this. I mean, it's so easy to look at it and say, oh, I'm singing the same song for years and years and years. It can be boring. but. And if I stay awake in it, it keeps teaching me. I keep learning. They'd never spend a night apart For 60 years she heard him snore Now they're in a hospital In separate beds on different floors I was afraid to do this song because I thought it, two things. One was I thought it might be too sad for people. And the other was um, I knew how personal this was for my husband. And I was so afraid that if people didn't respond to the song that that would be really difficult for him because it, it took a tremendous amount of vulnerability to write it. And it was a huge hit. You know, we never thought it would be out as a single. I put it on my record as a song that needed to be heard. It was kind of a closing piece. And I did it in New York. I'd been doing it in my shows at the time, and it would get a standing ovation mm -hmm. every night. In the middle of the show, people would just jump to their feet. And so we had to keep, I mean, I kept it in the show, and I did it in New York, and a whole bunch of people from the record company in New York came, and they saw this. And they started fighting to have it released as a single. And we were like, oh my God. Oh my God, the head of the New York branch wants it out. What are we gonna do? We can't say no to him, but my God, what's gonna happen? There'll be traffic jams on the way to work. People will be crying in their cars. They don't wanna hear that going to work and morning drive. And you know, what we found was that people just wanna be moved, you know? People, people, that's what music's for, is to make us feel. Your mother had Alzheimer's. Two of her sisters, two of her four sisters, five sisters rather, had, had Alzheimer's. And it's something that, that you've thought about. You've, yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we talk about, you know, genetics loads the gun and environment pulls the trigger. So you haven't lived in West Virginia for quite a long time and knock on wood, <laughs> you, you may escape it, but you've actually thought about, what if I don't? Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about that and what that means in terms of your contribution and, and the way you're leading your life right now and, you, and the music you're making. Well, I, I think I would, I like to think I'd be doing the same thing. I mean, really, if I'm looking for way, like, if I'm listening inside for my compass to point me to what the next thing for me to do is, um, then I'm going to stay on track for what's the best use of my life. Um, but the thing about the Alzheimer's is that my husband is eight years older than me and we have no children. And so what that means is it will not look for me like it did for my mom. Where, where you we, kids went home and... We really took care of her and, uh, and did really well as a team, my brothers and me. So 
I'm trying to find the balance between not living in panic and not burying my head in the sand. I want to be realistic about what the possibilities are and I want to plan. I want to plan and uh, if I start to see signs, I want to have like uh, plans in place so that I don't have to sit around and wonder what if. And I want to take responsibility for that uh, before, before that possibility comes into play. You talk a lot about the sacredness uh, of music and the power of music. And I, I listened to an interview where you were talking about Alzheimer's and your mother. And when she could barely communicate, she could sing your songs. And this was someone who didn't sing. She didn't think she could sing, she was so she never tone did. Deaf. She was She couldn't carry a tune. So she never sang. She was very shy and embarrassed about that. And... Uh, which I have a lot of feelings about these days. You know, people who get robbed of music by being told by somebody else that they can't sing. Nobody has the right to tell anyone that, in my opinion, because I think it's a gift for all of us. But um, she loved music. And when she got Alzheimer's, she forgot that she couldn't sing. <laughs> so she sang all, all the time. Her would slip yeah, away. She just was like a child, you know? She just was in the wonder of it. And so... Uh, I had my guitar and I had tuned it up and I hit a chord and she started singing. It was like, and this caregiver said, oh, we play your greatest hits every day and we sing while we're making dinner. That's what we do. So that my mother was just doing her afternoon routine and uh, I sang all my songs with her that day. I went through the whole list of songs on the record except for Where Have You Been. I couldn't do that. I couldn't bring myself to sing that one with her. And uh, um, it was the only time I remember singing with my mom. I mean, that was like, and she was just sheer joy. And a year later, when she didn't know me anymore, she could still sing all the verses to You Are My Sunshine. It's amazing how music is often spared. Everything else goes, but music is spared. It, there was someone who did a book a couple of years ago, a researcher, who's, who discovered that music lives in a very different place in our brain than language or... I mean, even my mom's ability to know herself or anyone else was gone. But mu the music was still there. I have this picture of me in some nursing home, you know, when I'm in my 90s, you know, that I won't be able to talk to anyone, but I'll just rattle off 18 wheels every now and then. <laughs> and that's what, that's what uh, one of Jean's sons said to me the night. He said, yeah, she can't tell you what she had for breakfast, but she still knows all 950 <laughs> verses of Barbara Allen. <laughs> Well, the power of music. You, you once said that a three-minute song can have as much impact as, a, as an hour-long movie in terms of the way we feel about issues. What impact do you think your songs, these, last, these latest two albums, have on our conversation about coal and where it belongs in our energy future? Well, you know, one of the interesting things when I... There had been this big mine disaster, and uh, I felt all this grief and... and uh, Sago mine disaster. Yeah, the Sago mine disaster. Yes. And so that was the motivation to make this coal album. I thought, well, I'll channel all this grief into an album, and I'll get, the, get it out of my system, and then I'll go on with my life, right? So that wasn't quite how it worked out, but it really changed everything for me. And um, one of the things that really struck me was these songs, they were old, you know, some were from the 40s and the 50s and 60s and 70s. And a lot of the stories were exactly the same. Relevant I know, today. Yeah, I know people who are living those words, those exact stories today. And I thought, now that speaks for itself. You don't need to say anything, except this song was written in 1972. And then you sing. Mm -hmm. And people get the point. And it's three minutes of their time. And, you know, fun to listen to, too. And um, that's what's so compelling about this music to me. It's just so... Uh, Oh, it's just about the human experience, you know, and it's so rich. People's stories are so rich. And, you know, even if you don't think that you're connected to coal, even though all of us are when we flip on a light switch, we're connected to these people in a human way as human beings who, you know, have ups and downs and struggles. And that's part of the beauty of it, too, is just singing about the fullness of the human experience. Oh, a miner's life is fragile It can shatter just like I But those who bear the struggle Have always paid the price There's blood upon the contract Like vinegar in wine And there's one man dead 
on that Harlan County line. How receptive are folks back home to the songs uh, and also to the message that's behind it? Because one of the things you say, and I think this is brilliant actually, you're not trying to vilify the coal companies. And, and you, know that new, or you know that West Virginia, its economy is a coal-based economy. Mm -hmm. This is, this is the, the lifeblood right now of West Virginia. That's right, that's right. And um, I, f I figured out pretty early on that uh, being somebody's celebrity spokesperson and pointing the finger and saying you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, I didn't think was gonna contribute anything of any value and it just felt like a waste of my time and energy and I just didn't think it was gonna do anything good and make anything uh, different. And so I, I decided I wanted to try to open up civil discourse, that I wanted to, that I would like to see more of that and I'd like to contribute to it. So a couple of things. Um, the Cole album stood on its own um, and it still does. The music speaks for itself. And I try not to get political in any way or uh, during my show. I want, this, I want to honor the songs and the writers and the writer's experience and the people the people who never get seen until some mind disaster happens. Um, I also want to try to do things like coming here and speaking at Penn State and opening up dialogue, helping people think about these issues and how they speak about tough things in their own families or lives in, our, in every context. If I can contribute to that, I think that's something good to contribute to the world. I do think that there are probably people back home that you know feel betrayed because I've, I've you know dared to you know not just toe the line and um, and be a patriot for coal. I see both sides, and I think that's really important. And I think there's a long run, a long term conversation to be had, and that's what I want to see. It's like keep the coal for now. And how are we going to take care of people? How are we going to take care of all these people who are the backbone of this economy? when coal is no more. So not the kind of backlash that someone like the Dixie Chicks got for mm. saying something bad in London <laughs> about George W. Bush, or uh, there was even criticism of George Clooney for getting behind what's happening in, in Sudan. There, you haven't had that kind of pushback, really, because I think of the way you framed the conversation. Well, it was interesting. Early on, when I, when I began to talk about this, there was uh, someone in West Virginia who started calling me out in public speeches. Uh, it was the head of the Coal Coalition. His name is Bill Rainey. And uh, so I picked up the phone one day and I called him. I called information and I got the number and I said, can I speak to Bill Rainey? They said, sure. They didn't even ask who I was. He said, hello. I said, Bill Rainey, this is Kathy Matea. He went, oh. <laughs> I said, hey, I'm not your enemy. I'd like to hear what you have to say. You want me, you want me to see your side of it? Show me. So I went to a strip mine with him and met the miners, had lunch with them rode in a big truck and saw how they do it. And, um, you know, I just want to be able to be with people and hear what they have to say. I think that's really important. And what you're really talking about these days is mountaintop removal, which you say is strip mining on, on steroids. steroids. Yeah. What is it? What's happening? Well, there's, uh, um, you know, you get into nuance and there's, you know, many different kinds of strip mining. Mountaintop removal is uh, the most extreme form. And uh, what they do is they blast the top of a mountain down. Sometimes they'll take a mountain down as much as 1,000 feet. And there are these layers of coal that are maybe six inches thick. And uh, it used to not be feasible to mine these to get them out. There was no way to get them out underground. But with the development of technology, these big machines, and, um, and also the price of coal going up, it makes it more feasible to, to, to get this coal. So they bulldoze off the trees and the topsoil off into the valleys and take dynamite and blast down to the first scene of coal. They push all the rock and dirt off the sides and then scrape up the coal, clean it, dam off the residue at the top of the mountain as this more and more coal gets cleaned and then they take that to market. And uh, it uses less manpower because the machines are bigger and more efficient. It's safer for the guys working than going underground. And, um, Unless you live below. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's much better for the workers, but everyone who lives around these the, mines are the ones that pay the price. They pay the difference. What do you hope ultimately to accomplish? I, I'm just wondering how optimistic are you that we can have a, a civil dif discourse about our differences and, and avoid a catastrophe that could be the, the result of global warming? 
I think, for me, learning to befriend my hopelessness is part of my work. I have no idea. Uh, I think it's going to be pretty tough. But I also think that in this moment, the, the, the thing that I am called to do is to try to contribute to the world what I want to see more of. So I want to open up conversations in my family, in my job, in my work with music, um, and I want to try to have them. Uh, I called my brother, who's politically opposite of me, a few weeks ago and said, hey, I want to hear why you think that guy's the guy and why you voted for this guy and why you think he has answers. I'd like to hear what you value and you know, I want to understand you. It was the most beautiful conversation. I thought, if I can't do it with my brother, how am I going to do it with anybody else? So I think there's all kinds of ways to contribute to the civil discourse in our culture. Kathy Matea, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Patty. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Kathy Matea. Comcast subscribers can watch this program anytime on Penn State On Demand. Find out how through our website, conversations.psu.edu, where you'll also find additional video from this interview. I'm Patty Satalia. We hope you'll join us for our next conversation from Penn State. Production funding provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Thank you.